Hello, hello. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Long time no see, long time no see. Hello, Quan. Thank you for saying hello. Oh, hello, Noreen. Oh, wait, wait, more people. Oh. Oh, I missed Faima. I'm sorry. Wow, my bad. Hello, Faima. Hello. Oh, and no, I missed it again. My bad. Again. Okay, take three. Hang on. Sorry. Let me take my three, please. So I'm going to start again here. Okay. Hello, Faima. Hello, Quan. Hello, Grisella. Hello, Noreen. Hello, Marlon. Good afternoon, Julia. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Oh, someone else is. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know why. I, okay. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Cassandra. Smiley emoticon and or emoji Yulia. Hi, Rachel. Hello, Diana. I'm fine. Thank you, Noreen. How are you? Hello. Let's get into infinite regress. Oh, and people are still mute. Hello, Elena. Hello, Shasha. Good afternoon, Ivana. Hello, Kareem. Good afternoon, Kazi. Hello, Anna. Okay, all right, awesome. And now I'm gonna do the other thing of hello, Kazi. Hello, Cassandra. Hello, Faima. Hello, Hannah. This is the not going through chat, but going through non-black boxes part. Um, hello, Noreen. Hello, Quan. Hello, Yulia. Hello, Grisella. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Shasha. Every one of those hellos is to someone who doesn't have a black box. Or um, hello, Kareem. Hello, Anna. Okay. And again, please let me know in the private chat if I'm still mispronouncing anybody's name. And hello, Diana. Hello, Ivana. Hello, Marlon. Hello, Elena. Hello, Adriana. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. So thank you guys. I know it's been a long time. We didn't meet last week. I totally feel terrible about that. Actually, I don't feel as terrible about that as the fact that I still owe you videos, which I still will post one way or the other, um, um, or one big video or something. I'm, But I appreciate your flexibility and patience with this. Again, the upshot of that is that you guys are not behind in any way. You haven't missed anything. You've just missed me, and I've missed you. Um, okay, wait, I'm just changing the view here. But we're going to get back on track here today. Um, I do have a lot of material to try to get back on track with. I'm gonna, I am gonna talk. We'll try to take a break or something. I'll try to make it not just all me talking, da 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 da, but there is stuff to discuss, um, namely this. Um, oh, and thank you for sending your responses in today for the eleven points. If some of you have gotten them back already, some of you haven't. But as long as you got my message that we're me well obviously you did because you're here so i mean and thank you um anyway um okay i want to analyze this is my feeling you're going to stop me right now if i'm wrong my feeling is that there's two equations on the board right here i my feeling is that the first of these two equations you have seen and you spent a lot of time unpacking or analyzing or using or probing <coughs> in various simulations and motion studies <coughs> yesterday, if not last week. Like basically what I want to confirm is, or what I want in the chat, please, privately or publicly, can you confirm or deny that you've seen, we've begun to look, oh, begun. Oh, well, that's an important modification. Okay, wait, please. Okay, wait, thank you, Hannah and Yulia and Noreen. And Kazi, awesome. Thank you. Okay. And Rachel, oh, I love this class. I want you guys are so like alive. Um, it makes me want to change my voice to something more like this. Yes. Thank you, Rachel, Kazi. Uh, and, oh, thank you for that too. Yeah. Um, and wow, well, thank wow. Well, I get an LOA. This or, all right, I'm gonna roll with this. But yeah, no, seriously, thank you. And again, points, points, points for having responded. Thank you. Um, um, um. Okay, so the first equation, in other words, what I'm, what you're confirming, what I'm making sure 
is that you've seen the first equation before. And I totally appreciate like Hannah's very polite sort of modification on the way I put it. Like, okay, granted that you've begun to look at it. Um, and, and granted as always, I don't want, I'm not a, when I write an equation say, do you know an equation? I am totally not saying like, you know this inside and out, right? Like you get every nuance there is to get about this equation. You could apply it and derive it with like two brains tied behind your back and blah, blah. Like, I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to confirm that this is not, it's not out of nowhere to you that you have some sense of it. And that's what it seems like you're confirming, which I appreciate. Okay, um, the first one. Now, the second one, the one underneath it, I am not assuming, even though, to be sure, the one underneath it looks a lot simpler. It doesn't look as intimidating or something like that. But I am not assuming that the one underneath it has directly come up with Professor Walters or anything like that. I'm not assuming that. In fact, if it has, that would be, I would like to know that. But I will tell you that sort of my goal for today is to get from the first equation to an analysis, to the second equation. I want to explore the first equation more with you in sort of a lectury way rather than a labby way. I want to unpack the first equation more. Again, assuming that you've seen it, but that doesn't mean you have maybe fully unpacked it. But I, in unpacking the first equation, I want to get to the second one um, and get to implications of the second one. Ideally, 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 just to give you a sense of where this is going, I, you'll know we've really made tracks and really gotten back on track. If if by even in the last two minutes of this class today, if I even mention something known as the Doppler effect, and now I'm issuing here, you are a public witness, I'm issuing a personal challenge to myself. If I even, if I even, if I even get to mentioning Doppler effect by the end of two classes, then it will be a triumph for us all. And it will mean we're definitely back on track of material. So hold me to that. Like the goal is for me to at least mention, to just tie this back to the existence of a Doppler effect. I, and if I do that, it means we have fully, we have gotten to where we need to get to with this second equation. That's my goal. Please pardon me for one second. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Hang on one second. Right. No, I have to remember. Pardon me for one second. Um, uh, we also like seen these equations in the lab, but we did not go over like those briefly. What? Oh, the, wait, the, but both, sorry, you're saying you've seen both of them in the lab or just the top? Um, uh, no, we, it was like a lab uh, prove or disprove those oh. two equations. And uh, we kind of like had to prove uh, whether or not, you know, those are working. And then we did not go really like go over briefly um, the second one, but we touched up on those two. Oh, oh, wait, that is very helpful. I, I miss, I didn't, I, the ones that you put in the chat, you're saying. The, the, yeah, 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 the ones that are in the okay. chat. No, that's very helpful. Wait, I, I may, I may want to follow up on that and once, hold on, I'm just, sorry, I'm attempting to uh, multi, task here for a moment which is hilarious because as you know i can't even do one task at once give me one hit okay. give me one second um bear with me for one second bear with me for one second Sorry, bear with me for three seconds. And by three seconds, I really mean like three and a half minutes. Hang on, I'm sorry.
sorry, I'm still here just um, attempting to um, solve for world hunger and cure cancer. It just will take me like a minute. I mean, we've all been there before, right? Okay, hold on. Remember when I said, hang with me for three and a half minutes? Uh, no, wait, wait, wait. Now someone is in the waiting room and what I'm gonna do is pretend that all of this delay has been all because of that person causing trouble in the waiting room. So I'm gonna make them wait one more second and then we're gonna blame it on them. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? Okay, one, hold on, I'm sorry folks. There's, uh, we're encountering technical difficulties and by technical, I mean, If this, if what I'm doing right now does not solve for world peace. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, uh, you've heard about the joke, right? About the doctor who, okay, I'm going to segue back into life here with this completely inappropriate joke. Please bear, remember the joke that I'm about to tell is both not funny and probably offensive to somebody. So it's really worth it. Here we go. A doctor is taking care of lots and lots of people who are vertically challenged, like lots and lots of people who are, say, under four feet tall. I shouldn't even say they're challenged. I'm saying they have a vertical experience that's different from that of many other people. So many of the people that the doctor is taking care of, okay, thank you. Many of the people that this doctor is taking care of are, right, are often measured in centimeters rather than meters in regard to their height. And they feel perfectly good about that and so do I. In fact, some of my best friends are less tall than I am, but that's the situation. So this doctor is taking care of many of such people, but he's such a popular doctor and he's so good and he's so sensitive to people's feelings and to their background and their heights that, you know, the, the office is like totally overrun. There's like, like, there's like people that need to be taken care of everywhere, everywhere. And there's like no more appointments to be made. And it's just like almost like a packed emergency room kind of situation. And at one moment, the receptionist comes in and has got, three more people outside in the lobby who really want appointments right now. Um, and they're also very vertically differing in their experience and perspective on the world. Um, I can't believe I'm, oh my God. But anyway, so she comes in, she's like, doctor, doctor, there's three more people that we need to see. Um, like, you know, can you make time for them? And the doctor is totally at the end of his or her rope and yells out in complete frustration, not now nurse, can't you see I have very little patience? Okay, that's, the, all right, so that's a chuck. that's, all right, anyway. Um, okay, so getting back to, um, that was so unworth it, as I said, both offensive and not funny. All right, um, 
Um, and totally offensive because it's about doctors, right? Okay, um, all right, sorry. Uh, so um, I just hope you got it. Okay, um, I wanna talk about these equations um, and sorry about that interruption before, but the thing uh, that, that actually, I, I actually do wanna take seriously for a second what Yulia, all right, so wait, so I'm assuming that the equation in the top of the board here you've seen, I'm gonna explore it with Young and Unpack it, but again, I, like, I, I, I think I, like I looked, at the, oh my God, at the simulation that you had done regarding it. I, I think I have a clue as to the clue that you have about it. But I also wanna ask now, Yulia put a couple of equations in the chat. She said, you said, um, of these two cosine equate, well, in fact, let me write this down. I think this is, uh, again, this is not exactly what I was going to say, but I think this is super worth it. If, if I, I want to make sure I understand um, Yulia's observation. Am I correct that, okay, so Yulia is saying that uh, these two blue equations that I just wrote, that you've seen something like this in a lab or in a demonstration, and you've, you've seen a little bit. And if I'm understanding Yulia correctly, you have, uh, well, let me ask straight up, Yulia, are you, is it fair to say that you have a little bit more comfort with the first of these two than the second? Um, it was, it was, uh, we had to like graph two graphs. One is like position versus um, time. And the second one was like position X versus position Y. And it was just Logger Pro uh, Lab. And uh, they both came out to be cosine graphs and, uh, and basically those two equations were like proven to be like, you know, correct uh, because we got cosine graphs, but um, we didn't really discuss like what like K or like, like variables in the equation or like briefly, but we've seen those equations because we had to like, you know, graph them when we got cosine graphs. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. It's really helpful. Honestly, it's really, and also the LOLs in the comments in the chat from other people are very helpful too, believe me, at least to my psychological well-balance. No, this is very helpful. Cause let me say to everybody, I mean, it always, I know it looks like I'm just like all over the place um, because I am, um, but no, this is what I'm here to talk about today. I wanna talk about this stuff with you. And the more that you guys sort of tell me what you have seen or what you are supposed to be knowing, but not clear, the, the better it is for me. So in fact, like the fact that Yulia sort of backed me up and mention these two equations and is honestly telling me and the group, like I have now a better sense of your honest, like comfort level with these. I think this is a better place for me to start than the thing I was about to say a second ago. So like everybody bear, in other words, the, I just wanna make clear, this is not a digression. This is not like off the topic. The, what me answering Yulia's question is not just for Yulia, in other words, like, I think she's just helped me and it's not just her, like you guys all do this all the time, but I, I think this is a better way to frame how I want to try to communicate to you guys. I mean, the ultimate goal, again, I will tell you, the ultimate goal of today is to get some sense of that first equation that I wrote on the first page, to get from there to the second equation I wrote on that page. And from that, understand something called the Doppler effect, or at least begin to look at something called the Doppler effect. Like that's the goal. I think doing it through the medium of these two equations will help a lot. So, so I'm gonna go there. Um, let me say to all of you, let, let's start with like, like, and I, again, I, by the fact that I just wrote these down or that Yulia just said them, that does not mean that I'm saying like, okay, given our clear understanding of these two, let's now move on. Like, no, I'm assuming that in particular, the second one might be very confusing to people. The second one of these two blue things is the newer one. I would expect that it's kind of like, I, I sort of know what's going on with it. It's a cosine, I guess, I don't know. Um, but let me try to uh, unpack. This, let me start by saying, 
this first one, this one right here, okay? That is probably the only part of the equation that I feel comfortable with. I mean, I mean, I'm glad perfect. that you circled that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Then we are on the same page. No, and I'm glad of what you're doing. And again, anybody else? Like, I mean, really, I'm going to say this over and over again. Every time I say Yulia's name to the world, it's what I'm trying to say is it's not just about Yulia to everybody. You understand? Like, I'm assuming that she's to some extent speaking for the group right now, and that it could be anybody. Like, yes, good. I think we're on the same page because that's the one part I would want people to sort of recognize the one job that we all tried to do together like before before we didn't have class last week is what most of our work as a group has been is to get to the point of seeing that yes this this piece is a harmonic oscillator specifically specifically let's even say this Specifically, like it could be a mass on a spring, right? Or yeah, it could be a mass on a spring. Like we spent so much time talking about in the first couple of weeks, like the, that homework thing on a spring, only one little tiny, tiny catch. You notice that the dependent variable here, we sort of somewhere along the line, we kind of just shifted our attention. We used to say things like X equals A cosine omega T. Now we're just casually saying Y equals A cosine omega T. It's not meant to be a radical upheaval. It's just meant to say, okay, let's picture our spring on a vertical axis instead of on a horizontal axis. Let's assume that it's doing all, which is kind of how you did the very first lab anyway, I believe. But we're saying now let's picture that we have some mass that's free to move up and down on a spring of, of stiffness K, free to move up and down on a vertical axis and and what we had spent some time, like weeks ago, saying is, okay, if we try to write out a function that mapped where the mass is to, to try to map where the mass is as a function of what time we're looking, like if we're trying to get an expression that you plug in the time and what comes out is the position for that mass, then what we had sort of been establishing over weeks is that function would be a cosine function. And, and you would have an expression A, you know, it would have a constant A measured in meters right before the cosine. That would be like the amplitude, the maximum and, in it, excuse me, the initial and the maximum displacement that the mass would ever reach from equilibrium. And then it would have this constant term here. Again, so in theory, the part that I'm circling in red, again, just to agree with you, Lena, the part that I'm circling in red is the part that in theory we have somewhat established and we have some comfort with to this point. And that part that's circled in red is like a, a harmonic oscillator, a object that is cycling back and forth throughout time and whose position as a function of time can be expressed in the, with this cyclical mathematical function called a cosine, right? Oh, cool, cool. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, that's total points, Kazi. Really, I'm not being sarcastic. Thank you for do, just even saying that. That is like so, oh my God. In fact, it's so many points. And again, I'm not here to like blow spiritual smoke. Whoa, I'm not here to blow spiritual smoke up anybody's part of any anatomy at all. But I do want to praise, like, like, Again, it's very helpful that like Yulia showed me where her mind was with this stuff. It's extremely helpful that Kazi's just weighing in and being like, yeah, yeah, I'm here too. Like, yep, I'm like, what she say? It's so helpful that Kazi just did that. In fact, I'm, I'm going to like derail myself once again and say a new a game portal was put in Google Classroom. Maybe even Kazi noticed this. I'm not sure. There was a new game portal put in, I think last week, but we never had a chance to discuss it you know, a new like getting points for class participation type of option, a new one that is totally an option. You could do it anytime, it's due December 1st, or you could not do it. But this one was called multiplayer co-op. Isn't that so clever? And what literally, it, it's four situations like exactly what Kazi just did. Just wanna make it clear that now, not only can Yulia submit her comments for general different kind of points, the different portals that 
to, including that she used her voice, including that she showed her face, blah, blah, blah. But now there's a portal called multiplayer co-op where Kazi, okay, now can go to that portal. And what that portal says is basically, if you ever, ever in any way, in any respectful way, acknowledge the contribution of another colleague and use their another colleague's contribution in any way to progress the class in any respectful way, even if that's disagreeing with a colleague, as long as you do it disrespectfully, then you submit that for points. And you mentioned both the people's names, you, you remind me. So like Kazi, and I think this is really important. There's like, again, a new option for people to get more points. Kazi can go to that portal and say like, yes, remember the time that Yulia gave you two equations in the chat that you, Yaverbaum, started yammering about in your usual Yaverbaum way. And I, Kazi, wrote in the chat, I confirm Yulia's, what did she exactly say? She said, um, I confirm Yulia's response, okay? I mean, she could screenshot that or she could just remind me. And if she does that, if Kazi submits to that portal, she get, I can't remember that, it's a lot of points. Maybe it's nine or maybe it's 11. She'll get 11 points for the fact that she like respectfully used something of her colleagues to advance the discussion. And Yulia will also get points as long as she also submits that same thing. Like Kazi gets points for being on the acknowledging side Yulia gets points for being on the acknowledged side. So it's literally a way. So the more you guys even just mention each other and like, yep, what she said, then you each get points for the fact that we're cross pollinating our collegiality follow. Um, I wanted to mention that. So, and I'm probably going to put another portal in that flips it too, so that it can go back the other way or something like that. I'm just trying to get more silly, but but so I, I, it really means a lot to me that any one of you can stop and say like, yes, I acknowledge the existence of another person in this room. Um, you both get points for doing that. And again, it could even be, she could have even disagreed with it. It'd still be okay. As long as you don't write something like, I think my colleague smells like, okay, no, then no one gets points for that. Well, maybe the other colleague maybe gets consolation, like feel bad points for it, but okay, you follow. Anyway, so thank you both. All right. Back to the program. Um, this so so the part that's in red is a oscillator. It is it is cyclically um, moving back and forth, moving back and forth over time. And what we had established even before last week, even before your recent equation stuff, we had established that this piece. Right, oops, sorry. We had established that this Okay, we had established when we were talking about one oscillator that omega was that constant term that describes the oscillator that originally was sort of just had to be there to make units work out. But what omega is, is, and I think people are clear on this, but I wanna remind you, because now I wanna extrapolate from this to the other equation and to the whole package that we're building here. We had said that if you have one oscillator, it goes back and forth, it cycles at a certain rate. In fact, let's, Right, one oscillator uh, cycles at a certain rate. Um, in some ways, the easiest way to think about that rate, in some ways, is just how many cycles does it complete per second? Does it make five round trips per every second, or does it make two round trips every second, or what? Like that would be one way to picture how rapidly an oscillator is cycling. But we had realized that that in fact because we're capturing uh, the, the physics of, of, of an oscillator through mathematical expressions. And our mathematical expressions uh, use functions like cosine. Cosine is something that is applied to circles. What we realize is that the mathematics that we have at our disposal are most explicitly designed for circles. 
And circles are an appropriate way for careful. Circles are an appropriate way to picture or consider cycles, right? So we realize like we could talk about an oscillator in terms of how many cycles per second it does, or if we really want to be mathematically quick and explicit and um, efficient, we could talk, we could remember that in every, we could think of every cycle as a circle and realize that in every circle, there are two pi radians, right? What is a radian? What is an angle? It's just a portion of a circle, right? And to go around a full circle is known as two pi radians. To do a half a circle is pi radians. A quarter of a circle is pi over two radians, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we started thinking of our cycling rates in terms of angular frequencies, radians per second, right? Again, an equivalent idea to just cycles per second. Also an equivalent idea to, to the mathematical reciprocal seconds per cycle. We realize, in other words, I'm gonna write this down. Well, I'll write it right now. We, So this is kind of like review of two weeks ago, but but also just saying all this to try to show you how the other equations work, how they're built off of this. Okay, I don't want to be tricky. Partly what I have on the top of this board here is still like review of old concept of omega for, an, for a harmonic oscillator, right? Partly this is still all review, still the top equation. But one way I want to, I want to, the thing at the bottom of this page is a way of writing the information that I've never quite written it that way before. Like what we had tried to say two weeks ago was that once you have some, once you have an, a harmonic oscillator, something that is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth at a constant rate, right? And at specifically at a rate of oscillation, which is not dependent on amplitude, right? That was the strict definition of harmonic. That's what I made a big deal about two weeks ago, that our an oscillator is anything that just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So anything that moves cyclically, periodically. But a harmonic oscillator, which is what we're talking about here, a harmonic oscillator is something that oscillates, that goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth at a rate which is number one, constant, steady, unchanging, right? And, and a rate which, okay, we end up calling omega, but a rate which is not only constant, but independent of amplitude, right? In other words, right? Notice that there's like three different ways that you can talk about the rate of oscillation. You can talk about omega measured in radians per second, or you can divide that by two radians per cycle and end up getting cycles per second, which we abbreviate with a lowercase f, which stands for standard frequency, right? And then we can flip that. And instead of talking about cycles per second, we can talk about seconds per cycle. And that's that's called period, right? Again, this is all technically review or, or clarification, hopefully. So this would be standard frequency. This was period, right? And so what we were saying is that once you have a harmonic oscillator, there's three different e equally, e there are three equivalent interchangeable ways to discuss the rate of its oscillation. And each, the reason we have three ways is that they each have a different sort of convenience factor. One is the most convenient for the math. 
One is the most convenient for experimental data collection or mental picturing. And the other is like the bridge between the two, right? So, but we have, but if you know one, you automatically know the other two. If you know angular frequency, you automatically have standard frequency and period. If you know period, you automatically have standard frequency and angular frequency, blah, 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 right? But notice that of those three that are intimately, uh, intimately related to one another, angular frequency, frequency, and period, notice that none of them has an A in the expression. Not one of those ways of measuring cycling rate has an A in the expression. And A, remember, was something measured in meters. It was like the initial and maximum displacement from equilibrium. So just notice again, refresher point, review point, that the essence of harmonic oscillation was that you have something that's oscillating not only at a rate that's constant, that's like already interesting, not only at a rate that's like steady, but, but a, rate that it, a rate in time that has nothing to do with how you set the thing up in space. Like it doesn't matter how far you stretch the spring out, whether you start the spring at 0.15 meters from the equilibrium position, or you start way out here at 0.65 meters from the equilibrium. Whether you ask the thing to go wah, 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 or you ask the thing to go wah, 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 either way, it'll take the same amount of time to do what it's doing. That's what harmonic means. Harmonic means true clock. Like, like big, big swings are faster swings by just exactly the right amount to take the exact same amount of time as smaller swings, which go slower on average, right? Okay, again, it's all just review, but, but that's, that's what a oscillator was. One way I want to put those facts together, just so make a mental note of this, please, because I'm going to like use this in a couple of pages. I'm saying one way that you could think of Omega then, what is omega? It's two pi over the period. That's a way of thinking of it. Like, it's almost like saying like, what's this rate? This rate is stuff per time. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, or no? Oh, I was gonna ask, is it uh, angular like frequency? Right, right, so angular, yeah, totally. This, yes, sorry, yeah. So, so omega, angular frequency, absolutely, yes. Sorry, Ang whoops. not angola frequency, sorry. Yeah, angular. No, 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 no. But yes, so omega is angular frequency. And one way to think about it from here on in, again, I'm just like algebraically smashing together things that we've already said. But one way you could think of angular frequency as is as two as is well, is radians per second, radians per time. You can write it as two pi over t. Why would you ever want to do that? Well, one, because I'm going to do something with it in two pages. But the other reason it's for some of us, it can be helpful to think of angular frequency that way as two pi over t because it's, it's like loosely analogous. Well, I'm not even sure if I should write it, but. It's like, it's not equal to or equivalent to, but it's sort of like thinking of speed equaling a distance per a time. A, a, a frequency is thinking, like speeds are distances per time. They are rates of distance per time. That's what speeds are or velocities are. A frequency is a rate of cycles per time, but angular frequency measures those cycles in portions that we call radians. So angular frequency could be thought of as how many two pi's you do in each period, in each one period of time, right? That's anyway, I don't, so make a note of that because I'm going to make parallels to that in a moment, but angular frequency is two pi over the period. Like that's just the case. Now, I still want to, I want to, so we, that's like our basic understanding of harmonic oscillators that we sort of had going into two weeks ago. But then, so I'm just gonna go in the order of kind of the equations that Yulia mentioned. Like then, that, that's all an analysis. Everything I just said is like an analysis of this. But then,
if we add a term, okay, and this again, now we had never done this in lecture up until two weeks ago. Like it's true, we, we had this a cosine omega t thing sitting around. Now suddenly you're sometimes seeing it in lab or something, seeing with this extra term in the parentheses. So I want to talk about that. Okay, that extra term. Well, first of all, it's lowercase Greek letter phi or phi. People pronounce it different ways, um, but it's the it's a Greek letter phi or phi. It looks like a rotated um, theta, uh, whatever. It's being used to stay. It stands for something that we're going to call the phase constant. It's known as the phase constant. Now. Whatever it is, it is a constant. It's just like some number. Um, um, and it's necessarily measured in units of radians. Like whatever this thing is that we're just sticking in there, it's measured in uh, units of radians. How do I know that? Well, number one, omega t has to be measured in radians. And you can't add radians to anything but more radians, right? Like you can add a meter to a meter and get two meters, but you can't add a meter to a kilogram and get anything other than a mess, right? And because it, you know, it's like people always say that, you know, adding, you can't add a kilogram to a meter because that would be like mixing apples and oranges, which never helps me at all. Cause it's like, yeah, and that's called fruit salad. Like that's not a problem. You can mix apples and oranges. I never understand why that expression is supposed to like reveal anything. Like. You could totally mix apples, in, but but you can't mix kilograms and meters. Well, you can mix them if you multiply them, but you can't add them, right? Okay, I'm totally, but you know what they also say? Okay, this is so stupid. They also say, cleverness is knowing that tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable, but wisdom is knowing not to put tomato in your fruit salad. Okay, um, so what was my point here? First of all, the phase constant phi, Oh uh, yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! Oh, we, uh, and I love the fact that Quan is able to actually pay attention to the physics, even as I'm distracting myself with stupid jokes. Yes, yes, perfect, Quan. Yeah, total points for that. Total points for that. And if anybody now writes in the chat like I agree with Quan, then they get points for, and Quan gets points. But yes, 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 yes. Um, in fact, yes. Um, yes, yes. Oh, nice. Oh, I see what you. Mm, yes. It's like the shift of the cosine graph. Yes, it's the shift of the cosine graph to the left or to the right. Yes. So it changes like the y-intercept of the cosine graph. Yes. And, and it's like the time that the cycle begins. Yes. Which let me, and, and what does that mean? It means like, right, like, yeah, when you start your stopwatch, when you start paying attention. Indeed, in fact, like let's be, so this is good. So you guys do know what's going on. Um, well, um, Right. Okay, I wrote this a little bit, but totally to agree with, and I really do appreciate this, totally to agree with Quan and with Yulia, like just as a quick example, right, phi is something that's measured in radians, and it's saying, right, it's saying at what point in the cycle did we start our stopwatch and start measuring the oscillations, right, so if phi were zero, as we assumed in our original discussion of all this, if phi is zero, that means we, that means that we start our stopwatch right when the oscillator is at its turning point, its end point, its maximum displacement for e from equilibrium, its amplitude position, right? And how do I know that? I'm just looking at the expression. If there's no phi at all, if phi equals zero, and I plug in zero for t, then the cosine of zero is one, so y, oh, I'm saying x, I should be saying y, but then y would equal a, right? When phi is zero, it is, in other words, when you don't have a phase head start or a phase delay, it assumes that we started everything at, a, at an end point in the cycle. But if rather, and I'm gonna change, but if rather, 
If rather we make phi pi over two radians, that's really like since there's two pi radians per cycle, that's like saying, oh, we're gonna we're gonna wait a quarter of a cycle. Quar if we make it pi over two radians, that's like a quarter cycle because there's two pi radians, you know, in every one cycle. So if we call phi, if we say phi equals pi over two radians, that means we're waiting a quarter of a cycle before we start our stopwatch. That literally means we would plug. So at t equals zero, we plug in zero for t but we would plug in pi over two for that phi. So we would take the cosine of pi over two plus zero, the cosine of pi over two, and the cosine of pi over two is zero. So in other words, it means waiting until the mass is all the way at the equilibrium position to start our stopwatches. So absolutely what Quan said and absolutely what Yulia said. Um, so phi is a phase shift or a phase delay or a phase um, head start. It just, like you guys are saying, okay, I think you're clear on that. Um, now, the reason we used to not have phi in our equations at all, but now we have it, is we never needed phi if we only had one oscillator. If, if you only have one oscillator, you should just start your stopwatch at whatever is the most convenient to start your stopwatch. And when you only have one oscillator, the most convenient place to start your stopwatch is when the mass has run all the way at, when it's going slowest, when it's run all the way out of speed, going in one direction, and it hasn't yet turned around to start going in the other like that's the easiest point to distinguish and the easiest point to catch with your stopwatch. So that's what we do. And we, if we only have one oscillator, we make phi, we set phi equal to zero. Phi becomes important if you have more than one oscillator and they're starting at different and they're, and they're, even if they're identical oscillators, if they're going to be started at different times, then you can't set phi, phi to be zero for both of them or for all three of them or four of them or five of them, if you have many, 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 so phi becomes an important way to keep track of, 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 of where things start once you have multiple oscillators. So in fact, I want to write that down right now. That's, that's, and that's what we're dealing with now. So um, let's make a note of that. Um, Okay, um, so sorry, um, Professor. So I, I assume that uh, the two equations that um, I mentioned earlier, it's like one is like how the object is traveling through the time and the second one is like how the object is traveling through the space, right? And so my next question is the first equation you um, put up on a board, it's like how the object is traveling through the time and space at the same time, like the two equations combined? Exactly, that's the heaviness that yes, and that's a very big point. I mean, that's in a way why I'm taking so long on this is that's a huge, that's totally right. Do I want to say it's totally right? It is right. And it's a huge point. The only reason I'm pausing, if I can say it's totally right is, it is right. Yes, it's the huge point that, that um, one is about motion through time, one equation, the one that I'm dealing with. Then the other equation is about motion through space. That's correct. And then you put the two together and you get the equation that I had on my board and that we're dealing with here. The only thing I'm going to add to that, well, I'm going to add a lot to it, but the one thing I'm going to add to it is the two equations become put together really once we have more than one object moving through time and space. And I'm not saying you didn't say that. I just want to make that totally clear. Like, yeah, the first equation is one object moving through time, one object going like this. Like, in other words, the first equation y equals a cosine omega t plus phi is the expression of a object oscillating back and forth in time, a object. And notice when we use that first equation, the time equation for a oscillator, like notice that visually speaking, there, the oscillator doesn't travel in any kind of curved path at all, right? 
like visually speaking, there's no wiggle. There's no, I don't see a cosine in life. If I just watch a uh, oscillator going like this, da, 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 I get the cosine thing once I make a graph, once I take a bunch of measurements, once I, and I'm not, this doesn't contradict what Yulia is saying at all. I'm just expanding on it. That like, if I watch something go blah, 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 and every millisecond I ask, where is the oscillator? So one millisecond, oh, it's over here. Oh, the next millisecond, oh, it's over there. Oh, the next millisecond, it's over there, it's over there. And I make a whole big table of values for all these measurements. And then I put them on a scatter plot, like all the time values I chart on the x-axis or I have Logger Pro or whatever, and all the, your Excel, um, and I have all the uh, position values going on this axis. So then I make a scatter plot of it and I'll see this cosine just to be absolutely clear to everybody, right? The first equation, that cosine equation that looks like this, Nobody's saying that we see a cosine in space. We're saying that the cosine represents what's happening in one axis of space while the clock ticks, right? That, that's the first equation. Again, total agreement with Yulia, no disagreement at all. Now I want to say, let's, let's shift our attention for a minute. Let's just go to another part of our brain for, oh, oh, oh okay, cool, cool. And I know, and I think you did understand anyway. I'm not like saying, but okay, cool, cool. Um, now I want to say, like, now I want to say, let's take a bunch of oscillators, a bunch of those time harmonic oscillators, and let's put them all together. Let's, in fact, arrange them in a big line. Let's, let's take a bunch of vertical oscillators. Let's, excuse me. Let's take a bunch of identical vertical oscillators and arrange them horizontally on an axis. So like this. Okay, what I'm trying to do right now is now I'm sort of like walking my way to the second equation of what Yulia put in the chat. Okay, I'm not trying to confuse him, but like I'm trying to walk to the second equation of what Yulia put in chat, largely because I completely agree that if we then sort of put them together or at least put them together in our minds, then we'll have the equation that I had on my board at the beginning. And, and she's totally right. And that is what's going on. And it is a very powerful thing, superposing these two equations together uh, to get one big phenomenon. That is what we're trying to do here. So in order to do that, I'm going to take a bunch of vertical oscillators. I'm going to arrange them on a horizontal axis. I'm going to remind, I'm going to make each one of these oscillators identical in its physical properties, in its measurable physical properties, otherwise known as parameters, right? So in other words, I'm going to take each, each oscillator has the same K. They all have the same stiffness of spring. Each oscillator has the same M, the same heaviness on that spring. 
and, and I'm going to put them down. And you might recall from weeks and weeks ago that, that K and M together fully determine the omega, the angular frequency of the spring. Again, this is what we mean by harmonic, that, that once you know how heavy that mass is and how strong that spring is, then you automatically know how rapidly the thing is going to oscillate, regardless of like how far you stretch it to or where you ask it to stretch from. Right. I mean, this is, again, a very deep point. I mean, I, I, like I can't say it's one of those points that sounds like, yeah, I get it. But then like months later, you might be like, oh, my God, is that what he's saying? Wait, that's so weird. Like or that's what happened to me anyway. Like I am saying over and over again that for an oscillator to be harmonic, what it means is the minute you know its material properties, the minute you fix its ingredients, you have necessarily fixed the rate at which it oscillates. And it doesn't matter how you set it up. It's not about its conditions. It's about its parameters, uh, the rate at which it oscillates. So anyway, so just like always have that in the back of your mind as, as, as the meaning of harmonic. So what I'm saying here is if we take a bunch of identical harmonic oscillators, if they're made of identical ingredients, I'm going to know in advance that they're each going to oscillate at an identical rate called omega, right? Now, let's say that I arrange them on a horizontal axis. And let's even say, to be even more specific, that I, I arrange them as nicely as I possibly can. Like, in fact, I arrange them in almost the simplest possible way I can. That is to say, I put them equally spaced on the x-axis, right? So like, like, I put one right on the y-axis, if you like, right at the origin. Then I put the next one. Um, oops, sorry. Like, I put the next one at one unit away from your one meter or one centimeter or one millimeter or whatever then the next one at two units away then the next one at three etc right no tricks up my sleeve i arrange them evenly then let's assume that i'm going to set up each with the same amplitude as all the others like that's up to me amplitude but let's assume that i do that that i you know i give each one the same initial stretch from equilibrium but I do it at different times, right? Now, this now goes to what Kazi was saying before and Yuli was saying before. Let's say that I set it up so that they don't all start at the same place in their cycle, that I stagger their phases, in other words. Now, that's a little bit of a complicated thing to do, but I want to ask you to picture the simplest possible version of that complexity that you can. In other words, if I started all of them, if I took the multiple oscillators and I started all of them at exactly the same place in their cycle, like if I did literally the simplest possible thing and started them all at the same place, then in fact, that would be so simple, it would be meaningless. Because if I started all the oscillators at the same place and they all went like this all together, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me erase the chat. Hold on. The windows are going crazy. So if I had all these oscillators and they were all arranged equally spaced and they all went like this, that would be the simplest possible way I could imagine organizing multiple oscillators. But it's so simple that it's stupid because it wouldn't be using the multiple oscillators at all. It would really just be one wide oscillator if I did that. Like, honestly, right? Like, then I've totally wasted the fact that I have 8,500 springs. I might as well just have one really thick spring going. So if instead I take these multiple oscillators and I arrange them in the simplest possible way that still meaningfully uses them as multiple oscillators, right? The simplest way to do that would be to stagger them all in phase. So I get some sort of interesting thing, but I stagger them by a constant phase step. That's what I'm gonna do here, right? In other words,
what I'm saying is, right, like, I'm gonna, it's gonna start sounding possibly complicated to some of you, but I'm using complicated words in a way to describe what really is the simplest thing you could picture in your mind. Like, like it, it, if you're picturing, a, so I want you to picture a bunch of springs that are all going up and down, but they're not all going together. They're all going differently, but they're all going differently in the simplest possible way you can imagine. In other words, imagine, for example, imagine that when the first one, for example, is at its amplitude position, then imagine that the next one, say, is at the equilibrium position, and the next one, say, is at the amplitude position on the other side, like the negative amplitude position, and then the next one is at the equilibrium position, and then the next one is at amplitude, et cetera, right? Like that's one thing you could picture. If you were to picture that, what you'd be picturing is that each oscillator differs in phase by pi over two radians compared to the last one, right? You'd be picturing that we're increasing the phase of each oscillator by pi over two radians per oscillator, right? Like, right? It'd be, it's, in other words, you're not picturing that all of them have a phase constant of pi over two. You'd be picturing like that the first one has a phase constant of zero, that the next one has a phase constant of pi over two, that the next one has a phase constant of like two pi over two, and the next one three pi over two, et cetera. You'd be picturing that we're stepping up the phase by pi over two per each oscillator, right? That's what I want you to picture. Now go a couple of steps further in your mind. Realize if you picture that, then if you're picturing an increase of like pi over two radians per each next oscillator, then, then as long as the oscillators are arranged equally along the x-axis, then necessarily what you're picturing is that we're increasing the phase of, or decreasing, the, the we're changing the phase of each oscillator by pi over two radians per unit of horizontal distance, like per meter, right? If you understood a minute ago, if you said, oh yeah, I get it. He's like doing pi over two extra phase for each oscillator. Well, then just let's assume that we put each oscillator at an equal place on the x-axis. Like assume that the zero with oscillator is on the zero position, that the first oscillator is at the one meter mark position, that the second oscillator is at the two meter. Yes, yes, that's where this is all heading. Yes, what we're ultimately, and not to skip, but yes, what we're ultimately trying to show here is that what that we're building a wave, like Yulia just said that, yeah, and I'm not gonna get, all, blah, blah, but yes, what we're doing here is we're building a wave pulse out of oscillators. Whether I say building, when I, when I say building, whether I mean like mentally we're picturing it in our mind or we're mathematically creating it from pieces or we're literally in the lab putting it together. Either way, of course, yeah, I shouldn't say of course, but yes, what Yulia is saying is, yeah, 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 exactly. I'm just like trying to re-explain your lab like from a different perspective so that it comes together. But yes, this was the point of your lab. And believe me too, if anything is clicking into place right now for any of you, then we're all getting our money's worth, right? The, anything I'm saying here is I'm trying to explain. Good, thank God, that's the hope. Thank you, Noreen. Yeah, no, that, and I don't know if you guys are being polite or not, but let me tell you, like, this is the hope. And really, let me tell you, if you're starting to see what I'm, and I'm going to keep going with this, okay? I am intentionally, I'm not trying to be redundant. I am trying to speak about your lab like from a different angle, but yeah, I'm trying to speak about your lab. And if for one minute, if anything is clicking at all to any of you, if you're like, oh, even for one second, then please hold on to that and please embrace it. Because first of all, like that's like the point of school, but like, but specifically with this kind of material, if even for one second, you're like, oh, this is that thing over there then that's really what physics is all about. What physics is really is all about is being like that phenomenon, that phenomenon, oh, they're part of the same. That's why we try to tie this, all this stuff together with math and stuff, because math is the universal language. But also let me tell you, because I mean, I've been on both sides of this. If even for one second, you're like, oh, this is what we were doing yesterday. Then don't make the mistake that I always do or have as a fit. If you for one second even have the sensation of, oh, this is what we were doing yesterday, please then don't go, oh, why didn't I get this yesterday? Or anything like that. Don't do that. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying I always do. Don't. If you're getting something now, 
that, that you're now realizing was sort of being said yesterday or something, please then don't go to either the place of, oh, I was an idiot yesterday. Why didn't I see this? Or don't go to the place of, oh, well, why the heck didn't the professor just say this yesterday? Don't do any of that. Because the truth of the matter is, if I had said this yesterday, it would make no sense. And then if you did the lab today with Walters, then it would be clicking into place. Like the whole thing about physics is you have to sort of always be patiently realizing that nothing ever makes sense the first time. The whole deal of physics, maybe life, is that we do stuff, we do stuff, and then we keep coming around the mulberry bush. And eventually, after we cycle around a number of times in kind of in different ways, then eventually, by the time we've done something like the ninth time, then we're like, oh, the first time now makes some sense. But if we ever make the mistake of going, well, why didn't I just see this the first time? You couldn't because it was the first time. Okay, like really, really. So if you're, if anything is making sense now, good, good, then we're all getting our money's worth, like really, really. And I'm going to keep going. But yes. This is what was going on in the, okay, so I'm gonna keep going for a second. So what I'm saying, but you're totally getting it. And yes, what we're trying to do here is, what we're trying to do is build, we're trying to understand. The goal here is to understand that wave motion, wave pulses are combinations of oscillators. Now, actually, let me say that slowly too, especially if it's starting to sink in, I'm gonna go back to the page in a moment, but please understand this too. Like none of this is, even if you, like none of this is redundant. We're just, we're helicing. <laughs> okay no good no really good no and i'm really psyched and i even believe you and 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 please hold on to that feeling like and no too it's not redundant and you're not wasting your own time or mine or me yours because because what i am trying to do absolutely is build wave motion from harmonic oscillation i mean that's what joe and i that's we're all doing here we're trying, we need, we studied harmonic oscillation for so long and so many weeks because it is the fundamental ingredient behind wave motion. And wave motion is freaking cool, comma, yo. Like really, like we haven't even begun to like, wave motion is like, are you kidding me? It's like the weirdest, coolest, most bizarre, like it shouldn't even be science, wave motion. It should just be like Harry Potter, but it is science. Like that's what makes it so cool. And you'll see what I mean, hopefully if you don't write in a couple of minutes, but, but here's my point is way, the fundamental ingredient to wave motion is harmonic oscillation, but that's the fundamental ingredient. You, one is necessary for the other, but it's not sufficient for the other. In other words, wave motion is more than harmonic oscillation. It's harmonic oscillation happening with har a different harmonic oscillation at the same time. Like it, it, one oscillator is not a wave pulse. A wave pulse is a bunch of oscillations occurring both in time and in space. It is, it is a hybrid thing. It's a beast. Wave. So the only chance of understanding it is to understand harmonic oscillation first. So that's like we always spend so much time on that. But okay, but I think you are understanding, so I'm going to stop yelling. If I'm yelling, it's because I'm excited, not because I'm angry. Um, it makes me angry how excited I am. Um, so, so wait, so what, uh, oh, so what I'm, sorry, so what I'm saying right now is if you can picture this idea, and, and yes, this is a wave pulse. If you're picturing that these things would start, like, if you picture, wah, 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 I can't even do it. If you're like, wah, 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 wah like, Yes, you're eventually going to see a ripple pass horizontally through the whole arrangement. That ripple is a wave pulse. Yes, that's totally what I'm building. But now let's let's back up and look at the ingredients of it again. Notice what I'm saying is that is that you're imagining that we increase the or we decrease the phase of each one of these oscillators by say say for example pi over two radians per oscillator. What that actually means then, I'm trying to argue, is if as long as the oscillators have been arranged in places along a meter stick, so to speak, then, then what we're really saying is that we're increasing or decreasing the phase by a certain number of radians per meter, per meter, radians per meter, right? And it's probably easiest to picture that step as pi over two. This is easiest to draw, like one being at the amplitude while another's at equilibrium while another's at negative amplitude. But there's no law that says we would have to stagger them by pi over two. We could stagger them by pi over four. You know, we can make them closer again, or pi over eight, or pi over three, or whatever. But whatever we're the whatever step value we're staggering the phases by is some constant value, and it's not a constant value of radians. 
it's a constant value of radians per meter is, is the stagger step, right? So in other words, Almost, we're almost at various places here. One thing I just want to, this is, I guess, a lot of writing here. Oh, it's almost looks nice. Um, so just sticking with this example, this example where we stagger each one by a phase step of pi over two radians per meter, right? Like that's what this example is. Then each individual oscillator would have its own equation to describe it, right? Like the first, the zeroth oscillator is y sub zero equals a cosine omega t plus zero. Like, you know, it was up at the amplitude position when we started to talk about okay, fine. Then the next oscillator, the first oscillator, oscillator number one, would be y sub one equals a cosine omega t plus one pi over two radians, right? Like it was staggered in phase by pi over two. Then the next one would be y sub two equals a cosine omega t, t plus two pi radians over two, right? Like always measuring the phase like relative to the original one, right? So on and on and on, all the way to the nth oscillator, the oscillator that's all the way out here at n meters from, from the origin, from zero, right? It would have an, the equation of motion to describe, it would be y sub n equals a cosine omega t plus n pi over two, right? So when I'm saying that for this example, this example, where the step size for, for staggering um, phase, in, in this example where the step size is pi over two radians per meter, I could capture the entire collection with one equation, interestingly, right? Like, like with one equation, which suddenly would have two independent variables in it, I could capture this entire thing with one equation and say, well, the whole thing in this example is y equals a cosine omega t plus pi over two times x right where like you so you tell me what time you want to look and you tell me where you're looking on the x-axis plug the both those values in and i'll tell you exactly how high like wh at what position on the y-axis i would find mass right if y the dependent variable stands for the 
height that I would find mass. If I just said, hey, how high, how high am I going to find mass? If I just asked that question and you just plugged in a time and you're like, oh, how high would you find mass at like t equals three seconds? Well, I mean, I would find one mass here. You know, there would be a whole bunch of, I mean, one mass would be at this height, a different mass would be at this height, a different mass would be at this height. So I don't know what the answer to my question is. But if I say, where would I find mass at t equals three seconds and at this position, x equals five meters, if I specify not only when I'm looking, but where I'm looking, then there's one and one, only one answer to how high I would find the mass. It would be wherever that mass was. The answer why, right? Now, I'm almost somewhere here. This equation that I wrote at the bottom is, is, is pretty general. It's like a general like, like, like rule for if you tell me when you're looking and you tell me where on the x-axis you're looking, I can tell you how high you find the mass. But this thing down here at the bottom assumes, it assumes this example where the step size was pi over two. I just, pi over two radians per meter. I'm just using that as an example. There's no reason that always has to be the case. So let's generalize this slightly further. Um, Right, this, that pi over two, please again remember the pi over two was a number that stood for radians per meter, the amount by which we increased or decreased the phase per each meter that we were looking on the x axis, right? That's what the pi over two, right? So let's generalize that. I'm saying that. I'm saying now, the equation that we had on the previous page a second ago, y equals a cosine omega t plus pi over two x, Right? If you follow that, I'm saying now just realize that the pi over two there was just a specific example. There's no reason that that constant always has to be 
pi over two, it just has to be a constant of any value we like, but a constant measured in radians per meter. That constant right there represents the constant amount by which the phase changes per each additional meter of horizontal length, right? Each new horizontal place that you look, each new oscillator that's placed at each new horizontal spot has a new phase that's bigger or smaller than the last one by this constant amount, whatever this constant amount is, might be pi over two, might be pi over three, whatever. Let's call that K. This is what K is. Not the old K, this is a little confusing. Not the K from Hooke's Law, not that K. It's a different K. So I try to draw it. So that's really annoying and I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. I try to draw this K with like serifs on it to make that clear, or you can make the other K lowercase or something, but this is a totally different K. And by the way, that really might've been what confused some of you in the lab without realizing it or not. You might unconsciously have been continually thinking that that K that was floating around was the old K that we've always had before. There, it's very natural that you would think that since they're both about springs, but no, this is a different K. And this K is the step size, the step the stagger step size for phase, if we took a bunch of oscillators, a bunch of identical oscillators, and we laid them out on an axis, and particularly if we laid them out on an axis that was like not the same as the axis along which they each oscillated, right? So they're each vertical, they're each identical oscillators oscillating along a vertical axis, and then we arrange them along this horizontal axis, and we let K stand for the constant amount of radians per each meter that each next oscillator uh, differs from the last one in phase. We're gonna, and we're gonna call that K, not angular frequency, but we're gonna call it angular wave number. Because now that there is a K, and now that we've arranged all these oscillators, now that we've arranged all these oscillators so that we not only see oscillation of each one in time, we not only see a pattern of motion for each one in time, but we now see that there's a pattern throughout those patterns in space. What we see is exactly what Kazi and Yulia and, 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 other, and Noreen and other people were saying before or noticing before, what we see now is a wave pulse. Like the, we've now that we've arranged multiple oscillators in time and in space, now that we've patterned out a bunch of patterns, what we get is wave motion. We get a ripple, we get a pulse, which is a very deep thing. Um, let me, uh, yeah, like, like um, in fact, well, Oh, sorry. What we're now saying is, and, and this really is heavy, and it, we're saying that we, what we've known before is if you just took one oscillator and you just let it go back and forth in one dimension of space, but you let that happen over time. Then if you did a scatter plot of that, of that motion, that motion that was only happening in one line of space, but if you did a scatter plot, of these spatial positions mapped out as a function of time, you get that cosine graph, like that's you know right at the top of the page here. That's y equals a function of t, right? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, y as a function of t, and you get like, and maybe you would, or and that's one oscillator. So if you did things right, you might not have a feet like the way I've done it. it sort of lines up on the y-axis, sort of nicely the way it should, but it might. 
you might not, like you'll have some sort of like phase constant possibly, right? That, that is what, it, that is what you'll see now. If, if you take our whole arrangement that I'm, I'm arguing, you make a whole bunch of multiple, you take a whole bunch of identical oscillators, you put them on the x-axis and you let them all go and you take a movie of that, right? Let's say like you let them, each one of them go and you take a movie. By the way, this is also kind of like you might, if this helps imagine, it's sort of like what you see or you used to see before COVID. If you ever went to the Brooklyn Museum of Art in Brooklyn, like on Eastern Parkway there, they have a whole bunch of fat, and there's other places in the world like this too. Uh, perhaps maybe even Queens has something like this too. I don't know, um, but I know Brooklyn does. Um, like a bunch of water fountains or yeah, water fountains in front of the museum and they each spray water up vertically. And sometimes when you walk by when it's on, like the water fountains are sort of doing this thing. Like one goes up and then comes down and the next one goes up and then comes down and the next one goes up and then comes down. And, and what you watch, what you see is, well, so if you pick any individual one, if you, if you feast your eyes on any one particular horizontal position. If you hold a horizontal position constantly in your mind, you just look somewhere, like maybe the beginning, the first fountain, maybe the 17th fountain, sorry, maybe the first jet, or maybe the 17th jet, or maybe the first oscillator, maybe the 17th oscillator, and you just watch it go up and down, once, and you make a graph of y as a function of t, you get this cosine graph. But now what we're saying, now what we're adding to the whole situation is, oh yes, but also, if instead of picking one spot and collecting data from the movie of that one spot, instead of holding one X value constant and considering the relationship between vertical position and time, if instead of doing that, you hold time constant, right? If you, in other words, make a movie of this whole thing, but then you pick one frame out of that movie, Right, so these things have been going up and down, going up and down, and then you just take, a, you just look at one frame. So you just pick some value of time, like right now, and you just look at the arrangement of all the oscillators in that moment. You let your eye, in other words, move from the left to the right along the x-axis. Of course, what you see on the y-axis is heights that vary in this cosinusoidal fashion. Right. In other words, for any one moment, sorry. In other words, top graph is any one constant position in horizontal space yields a cosinusoidal yt graph. But similarly, if you look at any one moment in time, any one constant point or value for t, and you just look at the relationship between y and x, of course, you also see a cosine graph. You see this. And maybe you know, maybe it's a different. It could be, it could be a different phase. That's okay. So I'm sort of trying to, again. This is all like what Yulia said before. I'm trying to show what the two equations are and how they're put together. I'm saying neither one of these by itself is a wave. Neither one of these by itself is a wave. The top one is a harmonic oscillator. It is a oscillator doing its thing in time. That's what the top is. The bottom one is is oscillations in space, but no time at all, right? The bottom of there's no time in that graph, that bottom, that's just a freeze frame. That is just, a, in other words, the top thing is a oscillator. The bottom thing is a wiggle. It's a picture of a wiggle. It's not a wave. There's nothing waving in that bottom one. That is just a design. That's just literally like, oh, look at that pretty curve that I'm looking at in space. Look at how th this spring is over here at this height. And then this spring is over here at this height and this, right? It's literally is a snapshot that bottom one. What we're saying is if you actually put a bunch of oscillators together, if you arrange time oscillations in space and let it go, if you make a movie and you consider and you experience the whole movie, if you consider what's happening to, if you consider what's happening to vertical position as a simultaneous response to both horizontal position and time, that togetherness, that one big thing, this one big, like neither one of these is a wave pulse. These two things put together, superposed is a wave pulse. So put another way, if you make a wave pulse, 
and then you separate out the data, you get these two relations, but they need both to be there to have a wave pulse. So a wave pulse is And I keep writing plus or minus because it really doesn't matter. I mean, it could be either one. So um, oscillations in time plus oscillations in space make wave pulse. Wave pulse is pattern of patterns. Um, the, uh, um, K, I'm going to say this more mathematically in a second, one well, second at a time. Omega is angular frequency. K is angular wave number. Omega is to time as K is to space. Omega is in radians per second. K is in radians per meter. It, not a coincidence. Total direct analogy. We are saying that for a wave pulse to propagate, oscillations must be occurring in both time and space together. Uh, that's what we're saying. I, I want to say more, but I'm just going to breathe for a second, or let let this, or maybe copy, let this sink in for a second. Um, that word on the top says superposition. Sorry, you can't. Really, I don't think. Um, oh yeah, okay. I want to, I will, I'll go, I'm going go to the next, hopefully this is somewhat clear, somewhat. Um, oh yeah, okay, okay. I'm saying this is the essence that, that a wave is simultaneous harmonic oscillations. But you know, I keep saying a wave, assuming that we all know what that means. And I think visually we do. I think we all know a wave pulse when we see it. And now we're trying to describe it mathematically. But but let me pause for a second and make clear what I think we're talking about when we say, oh, that's a wave pulse or whatever. So I'm going to flip the page. Tell me if you have to go back to this. Um,
Okay, what I'm writing here is probably illegible, possibly too wordy, but super important. What I'm writing here is kind of a description, but really, really, it's a definition. Let me, so let me pause on this for a second. What I'm really trying to tell you in English, in, it's a little bit vague because ultimately English itself is too vague to capture this idea. Ultimately, this idea is such a precise, beautiful, rich, and robust idea that in my opinion, it can only be captured adequately by mathematics. But here's the basic idea of what I'm, whenever from here on in, I refer to wave motion in this class or in life, if you ever hear anybody refer to wave motion or even more particularly, if anybody says a wave pulse traveled from here to there, or better yet, if they say a wave pulse propagated from here to there, because ultimately that's the word that we ultimately use when we're talking about the travelings or the motions of wave pulses. If anybody ever says a wave pulse traveled from here to there, or if they say a sound wave traveled from here to there, or they say a light wave or a heat wave or any electromagnetic, wave, any kind of wave, if someone says a wave travels from here to there, what do they really mean? Or, or, or by the way, or like we could be very concrete too. Like if you're standing at the ocean, I mean, at the beach and like ocean waves are coming in from a distant island or from a ship or just from the horizon, whatever. If you see ocean waves coming in to you at the beach and you're like, oh, here comes a wave. Oh, let's have fun, yay. Like even in the most casual circumstances or the most rigorous circumstances, if someone's discussing a wave moving from here to there, what is it they really mean? Why are they even calling the thing a wave? What is, what is it that's wavy about it? Or like, why didn't they just say a thing is coming from here to here? What they mean always, whether they know it or not, and what you mean always, whether you knew it or not, when you say a wave move from here to there, what you mean? So if you say specifically, like if a wave pulse travels from a source location, to a receiver location, okay? And those are the words I'm gonna use from now on. Source is like where a wave comes from. Receiver is where it's going to. You know, you just call it home base and first base if you want, whatever. But you can call it origin and destiny, whatever. But if a wave goes from here to there, what we really mean is that we observed motion from here to there. We, were, we observed some kind of motion that is reproducible, like we can make it happen again. It wasn't a fluke. Um, and furthermore, we can make it again for like our friends. So it's not just like in our mind, if we say, oh, the wave is going like that, we mean something actually happened in the external world that we all like noticed and we're not just dreaming of. We mean that the motion is measurable. So like if we say that a wave uh, ripple on the ocean like came in to the beach. Well, I'm not saying we did measure it right then. I'm just saying we could measure it. I'm saying that there's a thing where we're like, oh, it's, it's there now. Oh, it's here now. Oh, it's here. Oh, how far did it travel? Oh, we get on our tape measure. Oh, it traveled three meters. Oh, how long did it take? Oh, it took uh, three seconds, right? Or, or like in a lab, like you could send a wave pulse from one string to the other end of the string. And I'm not saying you always do sit around and measure it any more than you always sit around and measure the motion of baseballs or cars or, or planets. But I'm saying that it's measurable and it's analyzable and it's predictable. In other words, it's real. Okay, I'm saying wave motion is motion that by all scientific standards is actual motion. Like you could put numbers to it. You could make it happen again. You could use the numbers. You could say, oh, that wave just traveled three meters and it did it in two seconds. Oh, I guess the speed, I guess that wave is traveling 1.5 meters per second. I guess that's the speed of the wave. And then you could be like, oh, at that rate, if it has to go another uh, three meters, it's going to take uh, another two seconds. It'll be over here by then. And like any prediction you make about it would be just as accurate as any prediction that you'd make, in fact, more accurate than any prediction that you'd make about a baseball or something. I'm not saying, for example, even like a Yankee Stadium wave, like really, like, or like Shea Stadium, whatever, like a bunch of people in a sporting arena or a rock concert, like all going like, what? What? Right, right, right. And, and by the way, think about that, for example, like that's a wave. That's not just like a wave. That is a wave. It's called a wave because it's a wave. If we're all in a bunch of seats at Yankee Stadium and we make the arrangement or like someone sends the signal and passes around enough beer so that when it's my turn, I go like this, I go like that. And like all the people in front of me or in my section, I'll go like this at the same time. Right. And then the people next to us 
in a moment later, it's their turn. So they go like this, and they go like this. And then the people next to them go like this and this. And we send this ripple around the whole stadium right now. I like, think about that ripple. If you've ever done that, or you know what I'm talking about, picture that ripple for a second. That is totally a wave pulse. That is a human wave. Now, and it is it is totally all the things I just said. It's like reproducible, like dead. You can do it again. And generally people do once they've done it once. It's totally measurable. You might not want to measure it, but you know that it's measurable. If you really think about it, you know that thing is measurable. I, you know, like everybody knows, they're like, it's coming, it's coming. All right, it's almost our turn. Like everybody, you're not, I'm not saying you all perfectly agree, but you don't perfectly agree on measurements of baseballs either. I'm saying you all know what you're talking about when you're like, the wave is coming. It's almost at us. Like, and you could literally be like, you could literally measure how far it is from the stand, the other stands to your stands. Right. And you could literally like set a stopwatch and see how long did it take the wave to go around? Oh, this time it took, right. You, but even if you didn't take out measuring devices, you know that it's measurable because you know when it's your turn, right? Like the only reason the wave even works, like human waves are almost the best example of waves in a weird way, because the fact that human beings can even do them at all shows that they totally know what like, they see the rate at which the wave ripple is rippling around. And they know that rate well enough to be able to join in, right? So, uh, so, so when a bunch of human beings go like this and they go like this, and then, first of all, they're doing exactly what I was saying three pages ago, right? They're just all oscillating in place at a particular time. Like I oscillate and then pi over two radians or whatever later, the next guy oscillates. And then the next guy oscillates, right? It's totally what I was just describing a second ago, maybe in richer form, but here's the real key. The essence to the whole thing, why we call it a human wave, why we don't call it a human planet or something or a human trajectory or a human projectile. The reason we call it a human wave is because the, when, a, when, a, when a bunch of human beings make that wave in Yankee Stadium, the only thing that is moving is human beings, right? Like, I mean, I mean, like other things, right? The only thing that needs to be moving for that is human beings. A bunch of human beings are going up and then down in, in an organized way. The only thing that moves is human beings, yet no human being ever goes around the whole trip of the wave, right? Like, like it's so obvious. I mean, it's, you've known this your whole life about waves, but it's so deep. It's so actually weird. Like in other words, when a human wave ripples through a bunch of human beings, it is a wave rippling through a bunch of human beings. It wouldn't happen if each human being weren't doing his or her job of harmonically oscillating in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. It's all human beings who are doing the motion, but the motion is not of any human being. There is no human being that runs around all the stands or put it, go back to something more concrete, like, like water waves at the ocean. When you see the water wave coming in through the water to you and you're like, it's coming, it's coming out, oh, here it is. All that's moving is water. But there's no water molecule at all that actually makes a trip from out there to your face. It's a water molecule out there goes up and then comes down. And a water molecule over here goes up and then comes down. And then a water molecule over here goes up and goes down, right? In other words, it's necessary for this wave thing to happen. You gotta have a whole bunch of oscillators. You, in fact, I'm gonna write this on the next page now.
I'm saying that wave motion is real motion, but wave motion is a type of motion for which there is no individual or identifiable mover, not one anyway. Wave motion is a dance, an organized, highly organized pattern of patterns being manifested by a bunch of little particles, not one of which is doing the wave thing, right? And when I say that, what I mean is if a wave goes from here to there, there is no individual particle of any material substance that goes from here to there. This is what's wild about wave motion. It's totally real. It's totally observable, reproducible, measurable, analyzable, controllable, predictable, but it's not material. It's not material. For wave motion to occur, there must be material. For wave motion to occur, with possibly maybe one exception, but for wave motion to occur, just logically, there must be a wave motion is a wiggle. For a wiggle to occur, there must be wigglers. The huge, and what are they? That's a huge, for a wave pulse to occur, even one pulse to occur, there must be a vast collection of tiny material particles, each of which is, oh, sure, 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 thank you. Sure, no problem, thank you, thank you. There must be a vast collection of individual entities, each of which is harmonically oscillating in a small neighborhood at a, you know, in precise, organization at a you know, precise spatial neighborhood and in a precise region of time. A bunch of particles must be doing exactly the right thing at the right time at the right space for there to be a wave pulse. But once the wave pulse goes, once the wave pulse travels, we call that traveling propagation. Like we say particles have trajectories, particles move, particles travel. Wave pulses, we say propagate. What does propagate mean? It just means to travel. But we use the word propagate specifically and only when we're talking about pulses because we're trying to highlight to ourselves that when we say a wave pulse moves, it's a motion in every scientific sense of the word, except that what's moving is not material. It's, it's a, it, there is no thing moving. There, there's things moving, but if a wave pulse moves from here to there, there's no thing moving from here to there. So we call that motion propagation. All the vast collection of particles that we need in order to carry this out to do this, we call the medium. So when we say wave pulses travel through or propagate through media or through me, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Uh, oh, I, I'm so, that's so nice of you. I mean, thank you, Diana, seriously. And please submit for points. And I mean, really, no, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna go, I mean, I, I mean, good. And I hope, good. I mean, really, like, and look, and again, honestly, like, you can all tell, like, I think you could tell one thing. I hope you could tell one thing. I mean, hopefully this is clarifying a little bit. And if it is, then we're all doing our job. If it's clarifying even a little bit, if it's even, or by the way, when I say clarifying, like, okay, hopefully for Diana, it's actually clarifying something. But even, even if there's any of you in the room right now that this is not actually making things clear, but it's actually making you more weirded out by waves. If you're even like, wait, I actually thought I understood wave pulses before, but now I'm like, wait, wait, something moves, but nothing moves? What? If you even get the fact that I'm saying that there's something weird about waves and you never did think before there was something weird about waves, you thought they made sense and now you kind of think they don't make sense, that's also good. I want, I am trying to highlight for everybody that there's something to be appreciated here about wave pulses. And let me tell you two things too. Uh, one, I hope you can see, like, even if it's not perfectly clear, even if you don't know how is this going to be on an exam or what, I hope you can see, I can't fake this type of uh, intrigue or excitement, especially not in a Zoom class. Like, if you can tell that I'm a little bit excited by this, think about what that says. I mean, uh, and I am, I'm not faking it. I'm not just trying to be polite. I think this is wild. I think it's amazing. The fact that I can even understand wave pulses at all makes me so happy. I literally, I think that they're crazy. I think it's crazy that such a thing exists. And I think, you know, I've been teaching this since 1992. I've been talking about the same crap every day, really, for the last, what is it, 29 years, right? And yet every time I get to this point, I can't help but care because it's that freaking interesting to me that this even happens. Like literally that I could talk right now 
and you can hear me at all, like forget the internet part, but the fact that like I'm talking and my sound from my mouth is going into some sort of microphone on my computer. And then like crazy things are happening through the internet and all that's even crazier. But like even besides the internet, let's just assume my mouth, I mean, I'm talking, words are coming out of my mouth, they're going into the microphone of the thing, and then they're eventually coming out of some speaker and they're going into your ear, right? Something is going from my mouth to your ear. If you're hearing the words at all, forget if you're understanding me, if you're hearing the words at all, something is going from me to you. And you can call it sound if you want. I mean, it is sound. And you can understand at some level, I can claim at some level that what is sound? Well, sound is vibration of air molecules. Like if we were in outer space and there was no air, there wouldn't be the sound. Now that's all true. I'm not mocking that. Sound, I mean, air, at least in this context, is the medium. Air is the va like a vast collection of air particles, air molecules are necessary for me to get the sound to go through the air and get to you again, forgetting even the internet part. Like let's just assume you're in the same room with me for a moment. Like that's interesting enough for the sound to get from my mouth to your ears. If we call say oh, sound waves are going from his mouth to his ears. And what are sound waves? Sound waves are the vibration of air molecules. Air molecules are the medium for, through which the sound wave propagates. And in fact, if we remove that medium and we didn't have air molecules and we were in outer space, the sound wouldn't even travel. That is totally true. That's already like interesting, I think, if you think about it for a while. But like really think about it now. What we're really saying when we say that, when we say that by me talking and you hearing, I'm like vibrating air molecules. I'm sending a bunch of air molecules over here into harmonic oscillation. And then there's next to them, there's air molecules over here going into harmonic oscillation. And then there's air molecules over there, harmonic oscillation. And all the air molecules are each oscillating at some very specific omega. And they're all like spaced out from each other. Like this one's starting exactly when that one ends. Like the space and time precision demonstrated by the dance that these air molecules are doing, just to even just for me to send the note A to your ear is like astounding. But let's go even further than that. I'm saying all that's moving for without the internet, all that is moving at all for sound to go from my mouth to your ears is a bunch of air molecules. But not one air molecule at all is going from my mouth to your ear. I hope, I mean, there might be accidental drifts, but like for me to shout at your ear is for me to ripple a bunch of air molecules such that information goes from my mouth to your ear. The only thing that is moving for that to work is air molecules, but no air molecule needs to go from my mouth to your ear at all for this to work. Like, first of all, if it did, that would be gross. But second of all, like what? Isn't that wild? Like I'm set, I'm just moving air, but and I'm sending sound to you, but I'm not sending any air to you. What the hell am I sending? A wave pulse. What is a wave pulse? Well, we could say it's energy. What the hell does that mean? That's just a word to show that we mean it's something not material. I would say if anything, I mean, I don't what what a wave pulse is ultimately, I think, is information. We are sending something that matters, but that isn't matter. I don't, that still begs the question. That doesn't really answer anything. But I'm saying, let's get our mind around the fact that a wave pulse is an immaterial, not irrelevant, not unimportant, but immaterial, non-particular form of motion. If ever in your life you've ever heard of this, you know, waves versus particles, wave versus, is it a wave or is it a particle? Is it a dessert wax or is it a floor topping? If you've ever heard that before, like I mock it because I overheard it in my life. I, I mean, especially as a physics major in college, like I heard it all the time, is it a wave versus a particle? And it got, I got sick of it for sure. And I partly got sick of it because it was actually being conveyed to me in a stupid way after what I think, or I heard it in a stupid way, I should say. Like for one problem with that dichotomy, well, first of all, I, I just, I never saw, I didn't even understand the resolution of that dichotomy. But if you've ever spent any time as a science student at all, if you've ever heard, is it a wave or is it a particle? Oh, guess what? It turns out it's both. Doesn't that blow your mind? Like that was the part that always pissed me off the most. And I'm getting a little bit sidetracked here, but just to keep, but this is where ultimately the course is going, okay? You may have heard somewhere in your life that things are waves or they're particles. And then you might've heard somewhere in your life, something that we will actually say by the end of this course, where we're ultimately trying to get in the end of this course is waves that are even more exotic and more 
more interesting even than water waves or sound waves, which are already interesting enough, I think, or waves that are even more abstract or more bizarre than electrical waves or magnetic waves. What we're ultimately trying to go with this course is to something called light waves. Now, light waves are a, a head trip. I, I, there is a reason, it turns out, that I spent a lot of my life hearing people say, for thousands of years, people thought light was a particle. Then for thousands of years, they thought it was a wave. Then for thousands of years, they thought it was a particle. Then they thought it was a wave. And guess what? It turned out they found out this mind-blowing conclusion. It's both. Are you not crazed by that? And I was like, wait, really? Like, really? I, like, really? I don't get, I mean, okay, I suppose that's interesting to someone. But to me, what that sounded like, wait, oh, sorry. Yes, totally. That's awesome, Diana. Yes, that is totally, 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 totally what the double slit experiment is about. And in fact, I have a book about that that I'll show you guys later, like a kid's book. I'll show you that sort of tries to capture that too. It's on Amazon, if you, I think. But like, like, yes, it's what the double slit. Now the double slit's a perfect, and again, I'm getting myself a little bit far here, but we're totally going to talk about the double slit for real in this class. Like I'm just getting, I'm not getting off the topic. I'm just getting a little ahead of myself by accident right here. But where we're going to go in this class is to the double slit and beyond to the universe. Because, so let me, so let me totally indulge that. It's great, Diane, and she should submit it for many, many points, many, many points, because she made a good point. Let me say to all of you, yeah, if you've heard of the double slit or if you've ever heard like, is light a wave or is light a particle? Is light a wave or is light a particle? People didn't know, people got it wrong. Geniuses were stupid on this and stupid people were brilliant. And then it all came together in the 20th century when we decided this amazing thing that none of you would have ever thought of, which is that it's both. Like if you've ever heard that, like, you know, the truth is that is like about as deep as things get, but it didn't seem that way to me. I'll tell you, I thought that was the stupidest thing I ever, after all, because to me, what I kept hearing when I heard that, and again, remember, I like signed up to be a physics major in college. Like I was deliberately doing physics and I still thought all oh, that was, and I knew that was like the heartbeat of physics. And somehow it seemed stupid to me and not because I was so good at physics either. I assure you of that. It's actually because I was missing something, not because, of, but, but what, I, what I heard with that, when I would hear wave, particle, particle, wave, dessert, floor wax, floor wax, dessert. What I heard was, well, I heard a dessert thing. I heard a bunch of people saying like, we used to think it was like vanilla, but then we thought it was chocolate or more to, to me, it sounded like people saying like, we used to think that this dog was like a Labrador, but then we thought the dog was a golden retriever. And then we thought the dog was a Labrador. And then we thought it was a golden retriever. And we couldn't figure out, and then genius just like fell by the wayside. And then we got into a fight and we beat somebody up. And then finally we were like, oh my God, thanks to brilliant modern breakthroughs, we've decided it was actually a crossbreed of a golden retriever and a Labrador. Like its mom was a Labrador and its father was a golden retriever. And that required Einstein and a Nobel prize to figure out. So now go do college. Like that's what I heard. I thought they were basically saying there's these two categories. We couldn't figure out which category to put this one item in. And we finally decided it belonged in both categories. It's like really so you just had folders and then finally google invented labels and you realized you could put one item in two folders as long as they were labels and I felt like really that's what i thought but that's not what they were saying guys like what we're really trying to say here the reason i'm like like yelling about this is it's not that there's two different kind of items in the world and one's called a wave item and the other's called a particle item and it actually turns out that those aren't the only two items that's not it what we're saying is first of all we're not saying that there's anything called a wave we're saying there's a type of motion called wave motion. Okay, to get back to like the equations now and stuff. Oh God, am I gonna get stopped with it? Yes, I am. And I really will get back to the math in a second, but like, oh, but by which I mean a minute, by which I mean 10. Um, whoa. Yeah, that second equation that Yulia put, the second, the, like, if you're like most normal people in this class, the first equation, just like Yuli, like the first equation, let's go all the way back. Oh, well, I guess it's right here. Like this first equation is what we sort of understood, this part, then we added a term and then maybe we understood more. But then this new equation came along and was like, wait, it looks like the old one, but I don't get why is it an X now instead of a T? And why is there a K there instead of an omega? What I'm trying to tell you all is like, it's not a coincidence. The second equation is just like the first one, only it's for space not time, right? I mean, I think you're all getting that now. But notice that second graph, okay? Notice, if you understand that the first graph is not a wave, the first graph is a oscillator, right? The first graph is the time position relationship for a oscillator. Similarly, the second graph is not a wave. The second graph is a bunch of things. It's not one oscillator now, it's a bunch 
but it's all of them just sitting there, not oscillating. That's what the second graph is, right? It's an arrangement of oscillators in space, but captured in a moment when no oscillation is occurring. Just in its, So the first is oscillation in time, and the second is arrangement in space, if you like, right? I, I hope it's sort of clear. Why am I saying that? Because I'm saying there's no such thing as a wave. There's a type of motion called wave motion. And wave motion is a type of motion from like that, which is this. Wave motion is this. M wave motion from here to there occurs when there is some kind of observable, reproducible, analyzable, calculable, predictable motion from here to there, but no identifiable or distinguishable or countable or noticeable particular material entity of any kind goes from here to there. That's what wave motion is. Wave motion from here to there is a real motion from here to there for which there is no object going from here to there. When I send a sound to you, all that's moving is air, but I don't send an air molecule to you. That's what wave motion means, right? Okay, it's a type of motion. So when people for centuries or millennia or for years of your life have been going, they, so, oh, 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 no problem. Oh, oh, sorry, am I going over time? Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you. No, cool, cool, cool. No problem. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to keep going, but yes, okay. Um, thank you for thanking me. Um, when people, whenever people say like, is it a wave or is it a particle? The reason you might fuzz out or sort of stop caring like I do is because that's not really the right question. It's not really a fair question. You can't point to a thing that exists in the world and say, is that thing a particle or is it a wave? A wave means not a thing. But what you can do is you can point to a type of motion in the world. You can point to a type of motion. You can observe a kind of motion that might be made of, let's say, very, very small particles that you can't quite see at first, right? You can observe a phenomenon. You can observe a behavior. You can observe a, some kind of something that gets from here to there. And like sound or like heat or like light. And you can say to yourself, oh, I, I just noticed something go from here to there. Now, what I wanna know is, I mean, that's cool. Like a thing definitely did happen and I definitely measured it and all that. What I wanna know is, did a thing actually go from here to there? Or was this just a larger phenomenon? Was this a larger collection of a bunch of things, each of which, in other words, if you see light come from a star and come down to your, if you, if you look at a star and you know that light is coming from that star and going to your eyes, or you just look at a light fixture, a lamp, like, you know, in your ceiling, and you see that light and you recognize that light has come from the lamp into your eyes. Or you look at something on your desk and you know that light must have gone from the lamp to the item on your desk, bounced off that item on your desk and gone into your eyes, right? When you say, oh, light has traveled from this location to this location. When you say that about light, and it clearly has, like light was there and now it's here, right? The question, when we say, oh, is that wave motion or particle motion? We're not just asking, oh, is that red or is that blue? Oh, it turned out it's purple. I don't know why to think of that. We're not just asking, is it, we're asking when we say, is that wave motion or is that particle motion? What we're really asking is, is there something actually taking the trip or not? When we ask is, and I'm gonna look at the chat in one second, sorry, that looks awesome. Let me just finish it. When someone asks, is the motion of light particle motion or wave motion? What they're really asking is, is the motion of light particle motion or not? They're really asking, is there something that is going from there, coming down here and landing here or not? They're really asking when they say, is light motion a type of particle motion or a type of wave motion? They're really asking, do bits of light exist or not? I'm totally gonna look in the chat, but let me make this even one step clearer if I can. When I threw a baseball to you, that's particle motion, meaning there was a baseball in my hand, then there was a baseball over here, then there was a baseball over here, then there was a baseball in your hand. That's particle motion. When I shout at you, when I say that that is not particle motion, when we say sound travels as waves from me to you, what we're literally saying is there's no such thing as a bit of sound 
not because we just don't have the technology to find it. We're saying, I don't care how small and accurate your microscope is, you will never be able to look down into air so deeply that you eventually find a bit of sound. There's no such thing. Sound is a phenomenon. It's the result of a bunch of air molecules or sometimes water molecules or sometimes wood molecules, whatever. Sound is the result. It's a phenomenon. It's a collection. It's a behavior that results from a lots and lots and lots of bits of something else doing something very complicated. When we say that sound travels as a wave, what we mean is sound does not exist as a thing unto itself. So when people ask, is the motion, when they ask, is light a wave or a particle? That's like, no, that makes it sound like, are you saying, is it like a red thing or a blue thing? What they're really asking is, does light move as a particle or as a wave? By which they really mean, does light freaking exist or not? That's a real question. And, the, and, the, and there is an answer, but I'll tell you this, if the answer is just like, oh, it's both. And then you're like, oh, okay, it's both. Okay, and then you move on. Like, is it chocolate or is it vanilla? Oh, it's a swirl. I don't know why I didn't think of that. No, like something can be red and be blue at the same time. That means it's purple, but something cannot exist and not exist at the same time. That is a craziness, right? That's why these issues make a difference. Knowing whether something is moving as a particle or moving as a wave really means, is it actually there or not? I'm going to pop. Okay. So what, oh, so let, and then I'm going to look at the chat. I know Sasha has a great question in the chat. I just didn't see it, but I saw it. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to look at it. But all of this is to say, take a bunch of oscillators and arrange them so that each one is oscillating in time while the whole arrangement is oscillatingly uh, arranged in space. And then what you have is a wave pulse. A wave pulse is described by that one big equation that like this whole class started off like a wave pulse, which can be thought of as a collection of staggered oscillators. A wave pulse is a phenomenon for which position on one axis is dependent on time and position on another axis. A wave phenomenon is necessarily a function of two independent variables. That, co that cosine equation describes a wave pulse. If it ever seems slightly abstract or complicated to you, it's because wave pulses are slightly complicated and abstract. A wave pulse is not a thing. It is a phenomenon. I'm going to look in the chat. Cool, sorry. I'm not angry. I'm just excited. Yes. OK, sorry. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, beautiful. OK, Shasha and Yulia. OK, that's, boy, it's almost like you guys are paid to get me back on point because so first of all great question shasha and the answer is yes well look but see okay good but first of all great question shasha you get chunked to points for that please submit it second of all yulia's oh i should read this out loud i'm sorry shasha's question is is there a relationship between omega and k great question Yulia says, yes, omega, well, and she says, well, here's at least a comparison or a wave related. Omega is in radians per second, K is in radians per meter. Totally true. Also want to say, both of you should now submit that. Both of you should submit those things into the portal that says um, multiplayer co-op because you just had a constructive dialogue, like right in front of my very eyes. Like seriously, like Yulia should submit the fact that she just like answered Shasha's question and Shasha should submit the fact that she just asked a question that got answered. And again, by the way, even if I thought Yulia's answer was wrong or something, I would still say that you should do that. But I, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's right. But I'm also going to say now more about it because yeah, that's what I have to get back to now in the class. So thank you. Um, and LOL. Yes. So let, let's unpack exactly the relationship between Omega and K. Um, Okay, so what I just wrote there is a pulse, right? Like that's now the equation of a pulse. Again, if there was just the omega T, then it would just be an oscillator. And if it were just the KX, then it would be like just a shape, a wiggly like shape, but it's both. So it's like a wiggly shape 
like so it's like a wiggle that's going up and down up and down right or it's a bunch of up and down up and down it's a wave pulse that thing right so now let's unpack the omega and the k just exactly as shasha is asking sorry okay Now remember a few, see bizarrely, this actually all does come together and make sense. Because remember a few pages ago, we said that omega is equal to two pi over t, right? Radians per second. Well, what is K? Good question. K. Oh, wait, I should say. Just remember now, capital T, and we have a lot of like letters flying around. Capital T, like like lowercase t just means the independent variable time, like variable amount of time. The capital T means very specifically the period of time, the amount of time for one cycle, right? That capital T stands for period. It means the amount of time for one cycle that's measured in seconds, right? So it's literally like, so if we're talking about wave pulses now, what we mean by T is, the amount of time that passes between two successive crests or two successive troughs, two identical pieces of the cycle. In fact, let me even draw that to make that super clear. Sorry, let me try to. If this is a wave pulse, now right there, that's just a wiggle I just drew, but imagine the thing is actually like propagating. If this is a wave pulse, right, then, then, um, you know that, you know, this is often called the crest and you know that this is often called the trough. I think you know that, but let's be super here clear too. Like, um, the time between two successive crests in time, that's called period, right? But you know, in space, like, so like one, you're standing at Coney Island and one water wave hits you in the face and then you have to wait three more seconds and then the next water wave hits you in the face. That's the period of the wave would be three seconds. But you, since it's a wave, it's, everything is happening in time and space. You could just as easily measure the amount of space between two crests, right? You could specifically measure the length in units of space between two crests. Some people might even think of that as like the length of the wave. Now it's not the length of all the waves, it's not the length of the whole phenomenon, but the character, but a, a characteristic way to describe the whole wavy phenomenon would be the length of space between two successive crests or two successive troughs. And that would be measured in meters. And that's called the wave length, often designated by the letter Lambda, right. like lamp. That's a Greek letter, lambda. Like, lambda stands for wavelength. which stands for distance of length or distance of one cycle. And it's measured in meters, right? I think you know this from other classes. I mean, if you don't, I'm telling you right now, but just like T stands for the amount of time that elapses between two successive crests or two successive troughs or whatever, lambda, is the amount of space, the amount of length that is traversed between two successive crests or two successive troughs, right? Well, I think you might see where this is going. If, 
And then according to that, K is equal to two pi over lambda. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer Shasha's question, but I'm also trying to do what I was gonna do anyway. Like I'm about to relate that omega is angular frequency, it's number of cycles per time. K is angular wave number, it's number of cycles per space, right? So omega is like how many radians, how ra omega ultimately inversely tells you how much time it takes you to undergo two pi radians, a full cycle. And K <laughs> tells you how much space you need to get through two pi radians or a full cycle, right? So that's what I'm saying so far. Now I'm gonna relate the two to Shasha's question. The real relationship between omega and k that is so important, let me make this more legible. It's not a mistake, I'm just making it more legible. The, to, Shasha, to Shasha's question, the really important thing about omega and k is that if you put one over the other, what you get is the speed of propagation, not oscillation, propagation. What I mean by this, I mean, I, maybe I think it's straightforward, sort of, but like, like, and, and you notice the things flipped up like two pi over T over two pi over lambda. So it's like one, oh, I, I should, I should, I know this, the math is a little bit funky, maybe. Yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. Right, the two pi's cancel out, and then t is in the denominator, and then um, lambda is in the denominator of the denominator. And when, right, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Oh, and I'm glad that Shasha of all people is saying that. I love the oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so right. So this is actually kind of crazy, right? I mean, if you put omega over k then you have a fraction over a fraction. The way to divide by a fraction is you multiply by its reciprocal, right? So the lambda like flips up and we have meters over second, right? Omega over K gives us meters over second. And what we really mean by that is the meters of a cycle divided by the seconds of a cycle. So if you're standing at Coney Island or Far Rockaway, whatever, and water waves are coming, and this could apply to any waves, the sound waves, whatever, but or certainly the ripples that are going back and forth on the string in, in the lab, simulation. <clears throat> but if you're standing at Coney Island and waves are coming in and then you make a measurement and you're like, oh, from this crest that just hit me in the face to the next crest that's about to hit me in the face is five meters between them. And if it takes 
two seconds, like if the first one hits you in the face and then you have to wait two more seconds till the next one, what that means is five divided by two is 2.5 meters per second. It means that the whole phenomenon, the ripple, the pulse is propagating along the surface of the water at a speed of, in this case, 2.5 meters per second, right? Now, I mean, there's a lot of different motions happening here. When I say speed in this case, what, why this is so important, why Shasha's question was perfect, I mean, it was like the goal of the class is to answer her question, um, is, is uh, that, I'm, that I'm not talking about, like, Water is made of all these little oscillating water molecules. I'm not talking about the V of like some little water molecule going up or down. If you remember back to thing on a spring, remember back to the homework number one, like that V is changing all the time. Like as a water molecule goes up, it hits an amplitude position and now has a speed of zero. Then it's going faster and faster towards the equilibrium position, then slower and slower, and then faster, right? Like that V is changing all the time and that V is accelerating and the acceleration is changing all the time. I'm not talking about oscillation Vs here. I'm talking about propagation V. I'm talking about the rate in which the actual immaterial pulse starts traveling through space. Like in other words, when we say, when we say the speed of sound wave is 340 meters per second, we're talking about the speed at which the sound propagates through air from my mouth to your ears when we, if we say that it covers 340 meters of space between you and me every second, we're talking about this. We're saying that it's omega over its K is 340, okay? That's, and the reason Sasha's question is so important, the reason this is such a big deal. Wait, okay, so first of all, it's like a new equation. It's the equation that I had on the first page of today, right? This is what I said I was gonna get to. Strangely, we are getting to it. Um, so, so if you want to understand, so if you understood omega sort of for harmonic oscillations, and now you're starting to understand k better. K is to space as omega is to time. Put them together, and what you get is space per time. You get the speed of this wave pulse. Now, again, this does not apply to one oscillator. One oscillator does not propagate, and this does not apply to just a shape of a wiggle, like. Um, frozen in space, there's no propagation there either. But if the wiggle is oscillating, or if the oscillators are collected and staggered, then you got a wave pulse, and it's propagating through at this omega per k rate. That is a very big result because
what I'm seeing here, we're about to go to the next page and I am watching the time. This will be perfect. Um, what I'm saying here is, okay, summary so far, a wave will propagate at a speed of V, call that speed V, V is omega over K. Okay, nice, simple sort of equation. And omega over K is like saying uh, distance over time. Oh, in fact, by the way, in a lot of books, you'll see that. That's a very important way to see it right now in our class, but I should also say that in a lot of books, it's written like this. Totally equivalent. You could say omega over K, or in other, okay, I'll be even more, I'm sorry. Just so you can translate to other courses, like if you take instrumental and stuff like that, it becomes very important to recognize. These are three different equivalent, I mean, three equivalent ways of saying the same thing. You could say omega over K, or you could say lambda over T, like we did on the back page, or you could recognize that T is the reciprocal of F. So you could say lambda F. In fact, that's a very common way of saying the speed of a wave is it's wavelength times its frequency. Very, very common, very important in other science courses. I don't want to diminish that at all. Often we say V equals lambda times F, wavelength times frequency. Very important. But, but all interchangeable. Say it however you want. Here's my point about it. Here's my point is that omega and K are both fixed by the parameters of the medium. That is, remember, the medium is the vast collection of material particles that are all oscillating in a very regularized, specific rhythmic way, right? right? In order to have a sound wave, we need, we, we need a bunch of air molecules that are all, we need a, a collection of air molecules that are all oscillating in a staggered way, like the whole way we were describing with the math at the beginning of this class. Say, all waves are that, like they, the easiest thing to picture is a bunch of masses on springs on a table. They don't, but you know, sound, the masses on springs are molecular masses on springs. They're air molecules. Like it could be different. The point is, any wave pulse that occurs at all occurs because a medium was arranged, a bunch of material particles were arranged, each of which starts oscillating at a particular rate. The rate is constant throughout all the particles, and then the phases are staggered. Well, the rate of oscillation, remember each one of these is an oscillator. The rate at which it oscillates is fully determined by, fixed by, you could say determined if you like that word better. The, um, the rate at which each oscillator wiggles is fully determined by the material ingredients of that oscillator. In other words, again, remember, this is harmonic. The oscillation is harmonic. doesn't matter how far how they're arranged it doesn't matter how far you stretch the mass out on the spring it just matters what the mass and the spring are made of omega in the case of a mass on a spring equals square root of k over m in the case of an air molecule it might be the square root of 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 of, of, of you know pressure over temperature or something like that but it's it's per it, but the rate of oscillation is fully determined by the material properties of the medium through which propagation is occurring. Example, omega equals square root of k over m. So what? The so what is this?
What I mean by this, and we have six minutes left. This is just exactly where I'm going to hit right. Okay, I'm cheating slightly here. Here's what, so, so let me just read this out loud. We've got five minutes. I'll just read it out loud. It says, therefore, for any and every wave pulse, propagation speed is constant relative to its medium. I'll break that down in a second. Like for the last four minutes, I'll explain what I mean there, but that's what it says. It's kind of legible. That for every wave pulse, the speed of the wave is constant relative to the medium, relative to its medium. And then what it says underneath there is, hence phenomena such as wakes, sonic booms, and Doppler effects. Okay, now that's a lot, you know, that's a lot to get into next week. We'll really get into that, but let me give you the overview of what I'm saying right now. First of all, I'm saying wave pulse, consists of a bunch of little oscillators, right? Now each, uh, a bunch of little harmonic oscillators. Now the essence of harmonic oscillation is that a harmonic oscillator cycles back and forth, back and forth at a rate that is fully determined by its material properties, what we call parameters, right? Again, like masses on springs go up and down and up and down at a rate that is fully fixed by, determined by, and constant according to the, heaviness of the mass and the stiffness of the spring. If you know K and M, you know omega for an oscillator. What I'm saying is you put a bunch of these things together and let them go, you now have a wave pulse. But the pulse propagates at a speed that is fully determined by omega and by K. Omega and K are fully determined by the ingredients, the material properties of this medium. So as long as the medium doesn't change, then the speed of the wave will not change. This is a heavy point. This is a really heavy point. This is one of the fabulous things about waves. First of all, waves are immaterial. That's already cool and interesting, I think. But second of all, what we're now saying is, you ever notice that you hear people talk about things like the speed of sound? They'll just say things like the speed of sound. Maybe if they're being very precise, they'll say the speed of sound at standard temperature and pressure, or sorry, if they're being very precise, they might be, they might say like the speed of sound through air at standard temperature and pressure. That would probably be the best way to say it. But they don't say that about baseballs or rocket ships or electrons or planets. Like you could talk, right? Like rocket ships go all kinds of speeds. Baseballs go all kinds of speeds. Cars go all kinds of speeds. Apparently sound goes a speed. What? Why is that? Is that true? Like you could just say like sound just like goes a certain speed. It doesn't speed up, it doesn't slow down. And it's like always the same speed, like from one sound to the next. Yes, apparently, because it sound, like all wave pulses are ripples through a medium. And as long as the medium is fixed, like as long as all of the springs are made of the same stiffness and have the same mass on, then they're all gonna ripple at the same rate. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the pulse will propagate through at one rate. So more realistically, and I, I know there's two minutes, realistically, I'm saying like, you wanna send a water wave through the water in your bathtub? Okay, assuming that all the water is the same kind of water, like assuming it's all at the same depth, 
because depth affects pressure and it's all the same pressure and all the same temperature, which is not hard. Like that's a reasonable assumption. Or assuming you didn't like put a bunch of salt like in one end of the tub and then isolate that from the other end, or, which would be hard to do anyway, right? If all the water is basically the same water, then you start sending ripples through that water. And what I'm saying is all those ripples are gonna go the same speed. There ain't nothing you can do to change that. I'm saying, two th I'm saying you can make ripples more frequently if you want. You could tap the water a lot and make like a lot you can make ripples that you think are really fast, but what you're making is a lot of ripples coming out in short succession, and you'll make ripples that are really close to each other. You'll make ripples with high frequency and low wavelength, right? Or you can make the ripples like not very fewer of them, so you don't make them as frequently, and they'll be spread out, but each ripple will propagate through the water at one and only one speed and is fully determined by the nature of that water. The speed of a wave is fully determined by its medium. Once you know its medium, then you know the speed of the wave, and that speed will not accelerate or decelerate. This is also why we love wave motion. It's like all the fun of physics with never having to deal with acceleration. Let me be even more specific about that. Look, what I'm saying is if you've ever looked at any wave ripples at all in the bathtub, in the ocean, on a string, one thing I bet you've never known, one thing you can't know, one thing that you might notice if you look is that you never see one ripple catch up and overtake another. You can see ripples intersect. You can see ripples coming from two different directions and crossing each other, that's cool. But two ripples that are going in the same direction, one is never gonna catch up to the other. The gap between the ripples is always the same. In fact, we call that the wavelength. And the reason we even give a number to it is because it's a number. Why? Because one ripple will never catch up to another ripple because all ripples in a given medium will go the same freaking speed because the speed is fixed by the medium. So the speed of sound through air at standard temperature and pressure is 340 meters per second. And that is what it is. And, and then, and you'll never change that. The only way to change that speed is to move the air or move relative to the air. When you move the medium or move relative to the medium, you get weird, cool effects, such as wakes, sonic booms, and Doppler effects, which we'll talk about next week. That's the deal. You've been very patient. That is class. I'll totally hang out for any questions or whatever, but thank you guys so much. There's no new homework or anything. I have to catch up with you, but I hope that was clear. And thank you for being such a great class. I'm totally done. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Um, but I will hang out. Yes, have a great evening. Thank you. Have such a great evening. Thank you, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn off the recording, but I'm hanging out for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you.